All right, Thomas, say something. Hi, can anyone hear me? Did y'all hear that? Uh, try talking again. Hello, can anyone hear me? It's actually gonna work. Uh, did y'all hear what he just said over the phone? Someone said yes. Okay, cool. Okay, great. So we got it working. Fantastic. Let's get this show on the road. All right. Sorry for the delay, y'all. We're going to get started now. So let's start with the history of the Middle East. Because the Middle East, being the complicated area it is, requires a lot of historical background knowledge and context to have like a full understanding of the way things are in the region. But first, introductions. I'm my Ruben. Thomas Gill is going to be giving this lecture with me. Say hi, Thomas. Yeah. Hi. All right. So let's start with post-World War One. So essentially, the after World War One, we're not going to go into like super big nitty gritty details about all of what happened in the Middle East in this time. But we're going to try to just give more general details. So let's start with the Ottoman Empire, which is now known as Turkey. So after the World War I, the Ottoman Empire collapsed, and this led to a bunch of revolts. It led to the Arab revolt in the area in the Levant, encompassing countries like Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, etc. And it also led to the Turkish revolt, in which a group called the Young Turks, led by Kemal Ataturk, revolted against the Ottoman government and overthrew it and replaced it with a secular uh, democracy. And which and that government, the Republic of Turkey, known then as the Independent Republic of Turkey, has existed since then. So nations started to take their current forms. There was the French Mandate of Syria, also known as the Kingdom of Syria, which was essentially a League of Nations mandate meant to control Syria, keep it, un keep it stable and whatnot as well as mandates throughout the remainder of the Middle East, such as the British Mandate of Mesopotamia and the British Mandate of Palestine. Meanwhile, in the Arabian Peninsula, which was composed of a bunch of warring chieftains and their tribes up until this point, the, the family of Saud, or House of Saud, which is, now, which is now known as Saudi Arabia, started conquering large like swaths of the Arabian Peninsula and gaining power in Arabia which led to the formation of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It's named Saudi Arabia after the House of Saud. In addition, there was a coup in Iran that led to the formation of a puppet state government. That's not super detail and like, that's not super important detail wise, but eventually the modern like Shah, like the, not modern, the pre-modern Shahdom, the government led by the Iranian Shah, came to power as a result of that coup and served as somewhat of a puppet state of like Eastern powers at the time. Although that eventually changed with the, uh, like, com with the continuation of the post-World War I period. International mandates, going more on that. France controlled Lebanon and Syria as well for a time. And Britain controlled Palestine. We're not gonna go super into details of British Palestine because there's a lot of conflicting historical records of that period. And in addition to those conflicting historical records, a lot of those records have been stirring up a lot of controversy and might potentially push some sensitive territory. So we're not gonna go too deep on that. What needs to be, what needs to be known here is that in British Palestine, there was a rising in ethnic conflict between the Jews in the area, as well as Jewish immigrants that were increasing with the, after the World War I, and local Arab peoples, which led to increasing and escalating ethnic conflict, which eventually led to Israeli independence. But we'll get to that in a second. So on for World War II. A lot of pushes for independence and a lot of like the death of the old order came into play here. So Israel seceded from British Palestine, and, after, and this came as a result of several factors. One being the like mounting ethnic conflict before it escalated into a full out war, which led to the formation, which partially led to the formation of State of Israel. The second one is that ethnic con conflict further flared up when a lot of Jewish immigrants came after, as a result of the Holocaust into Palestine, and especially following the resurgence of Zionism after World War II. So 
after Israel's secession from Palestine, an independence war occurred, and when Israel won the war and declared independence as the state of Israel, a declaration of war followed by most of the Arab nations around it. Uh, there was international interventions in World War II as well. Reza, Reza Shah, the ruler of Iran at the time, was forced out of Iran by the English as well as their allies, and eventually, after World War II, Reza Shah and Mohammad Mossadegh took power in a military coup in the 50s. The English did not like this particularly much and as because he wanted to nationalize the oil industry, which there were a lot of English companies that benefited a lot from. So the West took part in a coup that forced Mohammad Mossadegh out of power. Also, my bad, Reza Shah, that happened after World War II, not during World War II. So the Anglo-Soviet invasion forced Mossadegh out of power and reinstated Reza Shah in order to make sure to, in order to like keep the current order intact. The other, the U.S. backed the invasion of, uh, the U.S. backed the coup that followed the Anglo-Soviet invasion in order to uh, ensure that they would have what they thought would be an ally in the coming Cold War because they because they did not believe Mossadegh's government was as loyal to the West as Reza Shah and his family was. So moving on to the Cold War. So a lot of what happened was essentially a continuation of the conflict between, of the Arab-Israeli conflict, as well as a bunch of nations continuing to declare independence. The major things that happened are one, domestic reforms in Iran. So uh, eventually, after, so Iran essentially was focusing a lot on domestic reforms. And in those domestic reforms, uh, which was at the time by Reza Shah's son, whose name escapes me at the moment, but essentially the Shah, that Shah carried out a form of domestic, like a lot of domestic reforms in what is known as the White Revolution in order to try to secularize Iran and make it appear more Western. A lot of the Iranian people did not like this. And as a result, popular discontent over this continued to be sowed over time, which eventually culminated in, and especially in the wake of anti-Westernism, because Muhammad Mossadegh, back, recall back to the old invasion, Muhammad Mossadegh was considered a very popular ruler, and as a result, his being deposed led to a lot of bitterness towards the West because Reza Shah and his family were not well liked. So, Eventually, Ayatollah Khomeini, as we know him now, began gaining some traction as leading in a religious counter-movement against the Shah, which eventually escalated to a full-scale revolution. The Iranian revolution happened, and as a result, and following the like Iranian embassy hostage crisis, which completely battered U.S.-Iranian relations, Iran proceeded to declare independence and continue like independence from like U.S. alliances and whatnot, and essentially standing alone. And as a result, Iran became a very religious theocracy, the theocratic oligarchy, which it is known as now. Iran, this was a big shift in foreign policy because up until this point, the U.S.'s foreign policy in the Middle East post-World War II was a foreign policy of two pillars. Essentially, the two pillars at the top of like U.S. alliances and Western alliances in the Middle East that would maintain their interests there. Those pillars were, were Israel and Iran. But after Iran turned against Israel, uh, Iran turned against the West following the revolution, America had lost one of its two pillars, which naturally did not bode too well with their foreign policy people at the time. And they scrambled to try to recoup their losses. They did so by doubling down on their investment in Saudi Arabia, with whom that they and they had had good relations and trade with the House of Saud since before World War II. So it fit well for their foreign policy. So they continued investment in the House of Saud, and as a result, they increased relations with them, leading to the current close ties between the two nations. So this led to, in, in the Cold War, we saw the beginning of beginnings of what the modern alliance system was. Because it, and rich, so the Western Bloc, after this change in foreign policy following the Iranian Revolution, uh, was composed of Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the Gulf states. Their goals, although Israel stood very much alone from the rest of those and didn't really cooperate with them at the time of the Cold War, mostly, and most of them still refused to recognize Israel's existence and still kept warring with them over the issue of Palestine. 
The goal is to preserve the status quo of the Middle East because the status quo of the Middle East favored Western dominance and Western hegemony. To this end, Western backing helped Saudi Arabia become a hegemon in the Middle East. After this, the Sino-Soviet bloc, or the Eastern bloc at the time during the Cold War, was composed newly of Iran as well as Syria at the time. Uh, the Al-Assad family was an element of this power dynamic. Essentially, the Sino-Soviet bloc saw the status quo in the Middle East as counteractive to the goals of the East. So they wanted to undermine the established order and create destabilization in order to gain hegemony and, un and uproot the Western order in the region. These, this alliance system, and we'll get to this, and I'll get to this more later in the presentation, is a big part of what defines current power dynamics and alliances in the Middle East today. But we'll get to that when we do. Uh, throughout all of this, Israel fought in a long, as well as all of this, Israel fought in a long series of wars that led to it gaining and losing land throughout, but eventually began to normalize more and more in secret, covert uh, capacities, relations with close U.S. allies, although that doesn't become more developed until later down the road. But the, United, but the Middle East begins to take its current form as current governments, to, as the governments take control and more and more does the Cold War force the Middle East to come more into alignment with international politics. So now we're going to go into U.S. interventions. Thomas? Okay. So we're going to start a crash course on a bunch of different U.S. interventions that happened in the Middle East in the late 90s and early 2000s. We're going to start with the second bullet, bullet point about the Gulf War. Essentially, because of these established like um, alliance networks that we're building, um, that we're building in the Middle East uh, between a lot of nations, um, uh, Iraq started to um, take a, a lot of issue with a lot of Kuwait's behavior. Specifically, um, they wait, talked Thomas. A can you, about, Thomas, Thomas? Can you speak up? Yeah, sure. Can you, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, you can hear me. Okay. So, because of uh, this alliance network that was starting to develop in the Middle East, uh, Iraq started to take issue with a lot of Kuwait's behavior. One of the specific actions that they pointed to was uh, Kuwait like exceeding their caps um, on OPEC oil exports, and that angered them to the point that uh, Saddam was willing to put um, a ton of troops on the on Kuwait's border. Um, and in 1990, they launched a full-on ground invasion of Kuwait, um, taking over a lot of territory relatively quickly. Um, the, the international response uh, was pretty quick. Um, the, the UN Security Council held a meeting and they, um, they imposed pretty hefty economic sanctions um, onto Iraq um, and afterwards um, Bush decided to um, essentially like mobilize a coalition that uh, included uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the UK were probably the main three other players um, to force a uh, basically a response to quote unquote uh, liberate Kuwait from um, this Iraqi invasion. Um, the US was pr uh, pretty quickly able to dispel this invasion. Um, the ground invasion only took about 100 hours before it was declared over and Kuwait was declared liberated again and returned um, to its uh, basically its former state. Um, uh, obviously, there's still like remnants um, of the Gulf War. There, um, there's still like a lot of instability um, in Kuwait and Iraq because of U.S. intervention. Um, so it wasn't like necessarily a success um, in that sense. But uh, the U.S. was able to like uh, repel uh, the Iraqi invasion. Um, more uh, probably like more relevant to the current form of the Middle East uh, was the U.S.'s um, and is the U.S.'s like continuing uh, war on terror in the Middle East um, after the September 11th attacks in 2001. Um, the uh, major response uh, that the second Bush took was on the um, uh, the invasion of, of Afghanistan in 2001, which is still ongoing. Um, because the U.S. Uh, was uh, scared of uh, basically like a lot of like uh, terror uh, ongoing uh, in Afghanistan because of uh, the Taliban and because of Al Qaeda, they started uh, Operation Enduring Freedom um, in 2001 to try to uh, dismantle Al Qaeda and basically to like try to deny it its um, existing uh, base of operations and its existing government um, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, and the U.S. like uh, had like a pretty big coalition, um, including uh, the U.K., Canada, um, and Australia. So it was like largely a Western coalition that was going in trying to dismantle the government. They were actually successful at dismantling the government um, in 2003, and that uh, led to the rise of the uh, Islamic Republic um, of Afghanistan.
Afghanistan. Unfortunately, um, even despite that, uh, again, like theoretical success that the U.S. had, um, that led to uh, the Taliban to reorganize um, in Afghanistan and to try to um, overthrow uh, the ISAF. Um, and they were able to they were able to overthrow that government, and now they hold um, a lot of power. And that's what's uh, basically that's what's led to the current um, stalling of peace negotiations that's happening right now between the U.S. and the Taliban, because the Taliban was able to, uh, to take so much control. And then there was like uh, a lot of backlash uh, within the United States um, against um, these sort of uh, foreign invasions because we didn't want to lose uh, U.S. troops. Um, the second one um, is the invasion of Iraq. Um, in 2003, um, the U.S. was basically scared um, that Saddam Hussein had uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, hidden somewhere uh, within his country. It ended up that he didn't, but uh, the U.S. basically uh, took pretty much like, swift military response um, in response to uh, that um, in, to, in response to that threat, again, uh, had a pretty big, uh, had like a coalition of uh, Western nations, but it wasn't actually authorized by the UN Security Council because they uh, weren't sure, um, they weren't sure that Saddam actually had um, these weapons. And again, uh, the, uh, the impacts of this invasion are pretty uh, long lasting. Uh, it lasted until 2011 before uh, US troops um, were like, um, US troops were withdrawn um, and like those, like there's still like quite a bit of instability um, in Iraq. Um, but uh, the other like major category is airstrikes that are happening and continuing to happen um, across the Middle East. Whenever the U.S. basically sees what they think is a terror threat, we're willing to go in with uh, with drones um, and take a lot of strikes. That leads to like uh, a ton of civilian casualties, um, and occasionally like the U.S. Uh, again like quote unquote succeeds and takes out their targets. Um, and one th other thing you want to keep in mind, and the trend you might be starting to notice, is that Western interference oftentimes is aimed at trying to keep regimes in acting in a certain way or make regimes act in a certain way that is conducive to their interests. You'll also tend to notice that a lot of that time it tends to fail. And nowhere is that more evident in both, not just in Iran, but also in Afghanistan. The fact that U.S. actions partially led to the current state of Afghanistan being the way it is is more proof really that anti that the West's actions in the Middle East more often than not tend to lead to the opposite outcome of what they want and only lead to more instability than they left it. So now on to the next slide. Um, so ongoing conflicts, uh, like I mentioned before, Israel has like um, a lot of like ongoing conflicts with a lot of other nations. Again, we're not going to go too deep into this um, just because there's a lot of like controversy. But um, just because of like historical um, ethnic and religious tensions, Israel tends to have like um, a lot of like um, military involvement, especially given that they have like a relatively like um, nationalist head of state and close alliances with the U.S. Um, probably their biggest enemy right now um, is Iran. They're fighting a proxy war against Iran in Lebanon right now and they're heavily involved um, whenever the US is involved they're willing to uh, they're willing to like engage in a lot of different conflicts um, on the West side now let's talk about the Arab Persian Cold War so this is very much a continuation in some suspect in pretty much every respect of the same like block alliance system that we saw back in the Cold War essentially there is a Western Bloc and an Eastern Bloc in the Western Bloc, led by Saudi Arabia, backed by the US and the EU. Eastern Bloc, Iran, backed by Russia and China, as well as countries in Iran's general vicinity. Typically, Shia majority countries led by particularly extreme, by, led by governments who are somewhat autocratic, tend not to represent the interests of the people all that much, and are somewhat extremists, as well as fundamentalists. The, a lot of the Middle East's current power dynamic is characterized by the clash between the so the most largely Sunni Western Bloc and the largely Shia Eastern Bloc, which is one, a continuation of massive historical tensions between Sunni and Shia Islam, which essentially have had, for a wide variety of reasons, massive conflict between them for hundreds upon hundreds of years. But more importantly, it's a, they're vying for regional control. Iran perceives itself fundamentally as a insecure nation. They believe that they're surrounded by enemies and threats and that a very powerful West wants their regime to be undone. And as such, they believe that the, only, that the best way for them to achieve security and the best way for them to achieve the security and hegemony that they want 
is for them to be the hegemon because they believe that only in such great strength will the West be repelled and only in such great strength will the West not be led to be able to harm them. And as such, they do whatever they can to weaken their obstacle to hegemony and this ultimate security. They do this through proxy conflicts. Now, essentially, the fundamentally, Iran wants to uproot the status quo as a result, and Saudi Arabia wants to maintain it because Saudi Arabia currently enjoys a status quo where it is the hegemon. And it helped, and it was helped to achieve that status not only through mass generous amounts of U.S. aid financially, but also through U.S. arms sales that has made that have given it massive arms capabilities, and over the rest of the region, as well as training in how to use those arms and general soldier training, and as well, the hard power and this on top of the extremely rich oil capacity of Saudi Arabia, which is a big part of the reason why the U.S. picked Saudi Arabia as its replacement for Iran as the second pillar in the Middle East, has allowed Saudi Arabia, has allowed Saudi Arabia to not also be incredibly wealthy, wealthier than almost every other nation in the region, given the vast amount of oil it controls. And as a result, Saudi Arabia enjoys this hegemonic status and it uses its financial power to uphold it, especially in the wake of the current prince's reign, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who has been using his power to do drastic reforms to attempt to modernize Saudi Arabia in order to keep it competitive in the region. The foremost goal of Mohammed bin Salman, as he himself has stated, is to ensure that Iran is quelled and not able to expand. And Pretty much all the foreign policy of both Iran and Saudi Arabia can be understood in this fashion. As a result of, and so, continuing at this, the Western Bloc used to include the secular Republic of Turkey. However, things have changed. After spending decades as a stable secular democracy, the most recent president, president Recep Erdogan, has, set, has become a lot more authoritarian. People can't really understand, don't really necessarily understand what caused the change, but around 2014, he started massively tightening his grip on power, met, distancing himself from the West and the East, becoming do, acting more independently, and start acting a lot more ethnically repressive, particularly towards Kurds and Armenians who still lived in the country, even which, and, and has also ramped up the official state's denial of the Armenian genocide that Turkey perpetuated around the time of World War I. So, the end result is that the Western Bloc and Eastern Bloc clashes are stronger than ever before. They, and even if, even though Iran's relations with Eastern Bloc backers, Russia and China, are beginning to fray, Russia and China are still backing other countries in that general bloc. And as a result, those countries are growing stronger as well. So even if Iran ends up losing its relations with Russia and China, those other countries are going to be filling in that gap. Now, the ways in which this materializes concretely is in term, is in many ways, but the most prevalent way is proxy wars. There are two major places to look at in this case. One is Syria. Iran does a lot of backing and state sponsorship of terrorism in Syria and many other areas of the Middle East. And that has helped to arm and escalate the conflict in Syria and make things a lot more brutal. They also back the Assad regime in order to maximize the devastation of the proxy war and seek to prop, it, prop up al-Assad despite all the revolution. There is also a lot of evidence that the Iran was involved in Yemen. Iran helped back the Houthis in Yemen and it helped give them a massive amounts of money and arms assistance. Another place in which this appears was Bahrain, and this was a much more direct one. Peaceful resistance cells that began to radicalize were given massive amounts of resources by Iran covertly in order to allow them to snowball in magnitude and become a lot more dangerous. This, invented, this led to the uprising of, in 2011 in Bahrain becoming a lot more violent and a lot worse than it and then it previously was, eventually escalating into a full-on rebellion and revolt. However, Saudi Arabia, in a show of massive military force, sent a lot of troops into Bahrain when the uprising happened and crushed the resistance in a brutal show of force. Although, which by no means has helped Saudi Arabia look any less intimidating or unfriendly to its neighbors in the region. So, 
the bottom line is that Iran and so that the entirety of the Middle East is just one giant chess game, foreign policy wise, between these two Nate two sides, with no regard for who dies and who lives. In in so far as the foreign policy goals of these two sides are realized. Now, another thing that's happening in this regard. <clears throat> Another way in which this turns out to be problematic is that it is a big part of the reason why the civil war is still happening in Yemen. Saudi Arabia views the Houthis as an, as an extension of Iran, as a threat caused in part by Iran, which is part of why they feel the need to be so brutal, because they want to, because they see it as attacking Iran. Iran also helps back the Houthis, which in turn leads to more death on that end of the war as well. Bottom line is, insofar as these two power blocks continue to clash, more people will die, more wars will continue. So you want to talk about the Kurds? Sure. Um, so uh, the Kurds are in uh, ethnic minority, uh, largely in Turkey, Iran, uh, Iraq, and Syria. Historically, they've been like very oppressed um, by their governments are viewed um like for example, um, in Iraq, they've been like uh, in Syria, they've been denied citizenship. Um, there are hundreds of thousands um, of people um, who identify as Kurds who have basically not been given um, basic human rights. Um, and essentially, what that has led to is a major uh, Kurdish push for independence um, in each of their respective nations. Uh, essentially, trying to push for an independent uh, Kurdistan. Um, and because of those struggles, um, Kurdistan is basically, uh, or the Kurdish people, have been willing to put themselves um, on the front lines in a lot of um, different conflicts. Probably the best example is um, uh, Kurd uh, the Kurds being on the front lines of, of the fight um, against uh, ISIS, um, essentially to gain um, to gain favor uh, with the West and to push back against ISIS um, in order to. Uh, get themselves on um, both uh, land and uh, in international recognition to push um, for independence to uh, basically like create their own state to avoid all this historical oppression um, and to have like a lot of um, like a lot of uh, representation for themselves. Uh, one last thing I forgot actually. So the two ma there are two major flashpoints that Iran and Saudi Arabia are currently most vying for control of. Those being the Gulf of Aden and the Strait of Hormuz. The Gulf of Aden, which in the little map on the top right part of the slide, you'll notice is the on the southeastern, southwestern edge of Yemen, right near Africa. That is the that essentially controls a massive amount of trade arteries throughout the like entire Middle East. Pretty much all trade through the Red Sea is dependent on who controls the Gulf of Aden. Therefore, the Gulf of Aden is considered an invaluable naval asset, which is part of the reason why Saudi Arabia is so hell-bent on winning in Yemen and getting a government that utterly supports it, and part of the reason why Iran continues to back the Houthis in secret. Uh, in terms of the Strait of Hormuz, the Strait of Hormuz, which is, uh, again, on that map, on the southwestern edge of the Arabian Peninsula, that little area that juts out towards Iran, that is the, it is, it contains a bunch of the Gulf states, such as the UAE, the, uh, the UAE's land, uh, Oman's land, and whatnot. And the Strait of Hormuz is important because it is the most, because it is the biggest oil trade route in the world, if I remember correctly. And because it's such a massive source of the oil trade and oil trade routes, whoever controls it has a massive amount of leverage because of their control over oil supply and oil trade. So that's why both of those regions concern themselves heavily with trying to secure those two straits. So on to the Persian Gulf. So since the 1970s, oh, yeah, sorry, what? Uh, one last thing. Someone just asked in the comments, like what the probability of Kurdistan is of becoming a reality. Honestly, it's super, super low just because the governments are willing to, uh, the governments who um, have Kurdish minorities within them are willing to use like indiscriminate violence um, against Kurds to prevent them from developing a state. They're willing to, uh, like in the past, like Iraq, for example, has like quelled any sort of like rebellion or push for independence with like a lot of like indiscriminate violence. Again, um, it, it goes back to what Maya mentioned earlier. Uh, the government Governments are willing to basically like not really care about like who lives, who dies, just to, like gain power. Um, they're willing to use uh, indiscriminate violence. And also, 
even the West has not really articulated much support of in, yeah. of independent Kurdistan for fear of alienating their allies, especially Turkey, which the West still does care about because it's one of the because it is a big NATO member and it is a big security contributor of NATO, even with all that has happened. And Turkey hates the Kurds probably more than most of the countries in the region, yeah. or at least Erdogan does. So now onto the Persian Gulf. So this is so a lot of why we're focusing on why we focused a lot on Iran beyond its obvious geopolitical significance throughout the history in terms of this presentation is because it is one of the two topic options for the Middle East that has been proposed for this season. So it's basically that the U.S. should decrease its military presence in the Persian Gulf region to prevent Iranian aggression. So since the 1979 revolution, as I told you, there's been proxy warfare with Yemen and the 2011 Bahraini <coughs> uprising. Uh, backing Shia extremists, Iran has had a history of backing Al-Qaeda, for example, and it is the number one state sponsor of terrorism in the world. It works closer to Eastern autocracies, as we said, and the key relevant thing is that Iran's Shia extreme, is that although the like decline and downfall of ISIS has been a very much good thing. Iran has been taking advantage of that power vacuum by ramping up its backing of Shia extremist groups to fill in the void. Because ISIS was a Sunni extremist group, meaning that obviously incompatible with Shia, with, uh, Shia extremists who absolutely hate Sunnis, and therefore filling in the power vacuum with Shia extremists would mean that now not only would there potentially be another equally terrible like threat in the Middle East, that threat would answer much more directly to the Ayatollah. So, since then, so what, uh, that's what Iran's been doing as of late. But beyond just that, I'm um, sorry about that, I accidentally switched slides. Uh, Iran has a weird situation going, going on in regards to the international community. So it's currently under sanction from quite a bit of the international community, uh, and that's a big part of the Iran, and that was part of the Iran deal. The 2014 Iran deal was supposed to essentially change the condition of sanctions on Iran in exchange for stopping nuclear testing and whatnot. The Iran deal has kind of gone downhill in terms of you know being able to even exist because the U.S. abrogated from the Iran deal meaning that they didn't just leave it. They pretended as if they didn't even, like, they acted as if they didn't even join it. They didn't recognize it, which is, believe it or not, from the United States in the context of UNSC agreements, unprecedented in the international community. It's never happened before that the United States has straight up abrogated from an agreement, which in turn has caused the Iran deal to basically nosedive in legitimacy. Regardless, sanctions remain on Iran and are massively constricting its economy at the moment. Uh, so, there are, there are two other major things here. One, Iran has access to a ton of oil in the Persian Gulf. The Persian Gulf, back to the, you remember the Strait of Hormuz where I pointed out on the map, the Strait of Hormuz controls the entry to the Persian Gulf, which has a colossal amount of oil in it. The oil in the Persian Gulf is obviously of great importance because Iran derives a lot of economic strength from that oil. And as the United States ever has had a significant military presence in the Persian Gulf for the better part of two decades. However, uh, in, the, in that time, a lot of things have changed. And the most, re and the most relevant, like recent event that happened in regards to the Persian Gulf and military presence was last, was I can't remember if it was this month or last month, when a U.S. spy plane got shot down by Iranian missiles while it was flying over the Persian Gulf, which led to a massive flare-up of tensions to the point where Trump literally was about to declare war on Iran and like launch a military strike against Iran and called it off 10 minutes before it was about to begin. So tensions are pretty high right now. The United States is looking at, mass, at, 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 at like increasing its military presence in the Persian Gulf right now in cut because it wants to essentially try to deter Iran and keep Iran in check. So that's, and the U S also has an interest in ha maintaining military presence there because of the oil, the U S benefits from that oil a lot. The U S military naval presence there is relatively like small compared to what it has been in like peak times in the past. But the presence there regardless is the main way in which oil tankers and ships transporting oil have been secured 
throughout the history of the of throughout recent history of the Middle East. So, and Trump has raised quite a hubbub about wanting to decrease security and have the Middle Eastern states do more to secure their own oil tankers, but nothing has really come of that rhetoric thus far. The opposite might actually happen now if they are actually go through with putting more of a naval presence in the Strait of Hormuz. So, the U.S. wants the Strait of Hormuz and tensions are flaring over it. That's the main issue going on with the Persian Gulf. The United States hopes to contain Iran and weaken Iran to ensure that it does not, that the current threat level that, it, that the U.S. believes it to pose is mitigated and they can contain Iran from acting out anymore. So, some affirmative arguments on the Persian Gulf topic. Uh, first, let me check for comments. Okay. Uh, so some affirmative arguments. The first one, obviously, is deterrence. Essentially that when, a, when the U.S. naval presence increases, it would scare Iran out of aggression because Iran would know it wouldn't be able to, you know, declare to win a war against the United States. Uh, likewise, as a broader, a broader spillover of that is that a higher naval presence could deter local insurgencies in regions surrounding the Persian Gulf because they would look at a U.S. military presence and say they're allied with the people we're up against. Maybe it's not worth fighting them anymore. Something along those lines. Then on trade security. I covered this a bit just now, but essentially the U.S. military presence is the most crucial factor for the security of oil tankers and oil trade in the Strait of Hormuz. So it allows for the increased security of the Strait of Hormuz against things like piracy and other such problems. Uh, likewise, you could say it also leads to successful intervention. The probability of this is low, but I'm just throwing it out there because it's a possibility. Essentially, the idea would be that the naval power of the United States would be used to back certain engagements throughout the Middle East, throughout the Middle East of, the UMA, of America's allies. And as a result, it would help to finish those conflicts up more quickly by lending military force to them. This could also, however, very easily be a bad thing. I'm going to a little bit out of order. I'm starting at the bottom here, but this is but continuing with the theme of what I just said, you could also argue it escalates and worsens conflict by adding more fuel to the fire. Essentially, for example, you could say that adding the US Navy to the laundry list of countries bombing Yemen is probably a bad thing. And as a result, that bombing of Yemen will lead to more people dying. You could say the same thing for pretty much any insurgency that occurs around the Persian Gulf that the Navy could possibly intervene in. So you could say it escalates conflict and leads to lengthened conflict and worse conflict. And that, and Yemen's a pretty good example of this, given that it's been at war for about for the and in a constant in like an inconsistent state of war for about a decade now, ever since the Arab Spring. So, on tensions. So, after the spy plane was shot down, you would also argue that throwing more people into the same area where there's extremely high tensions leads to the risk of a conflict. The reason for this is simple, could be multiple reasons. Well, one, miscalculation. You could just say that given that tensions are so high and now that you're locking the two, two of the most notable navies in the area into a standoff, essentially, in their, in their backyard, is inevitably going to lead to some miscalculation, which starts a war. But the other thing, which honestly, this type of like conventional war is much more likely than most topics in which miscalc is brought up, is a war between is a is Iran lashing out, and this might not necessarily be directly them starting a war with the United States. That's not particularly likely. What is likely is that Iran doubles down on backing proxy conflicts and escalating them. The reason being that Iran feels boxed in. Recall that I said that a big part of Iran's core motive for why they act the way they do is because they feel insecure, because they feel like the West is out to get them and dethrone them and undermine them. And as a result, all their actions are taken because they feel that only being a hegemon will make them strong enough to secure themselves against the West. In that same reasoning, logically, if you exacerbate that feeling by boxing them in with higher naval presence, it's very likely to make Iran lash out more, logically speaking, and lead to them doubling down on proxy conflicts. There are several hot spots where this could potentially erupt, such as Azerbaijan and Armenia, among other areas. So, another issue is moral hazard. 
So the idea here is basically emboldenment. The US allies will see a higher naval presence and they'll think that they're more secure and as a result be more likely to act out offensively in or thinking that the US will have their backs, which you could argue would lead to, in the case of Saudi Arabia, it might lead to them doing worse human rights abuses in Yemen or elsewhere, or it might lead to actions being taken to quell insurgency that lead to the curbing of human rights or straight up conflict. But this is something to look more into. So in regards to that, there are also some URLs I included. We're gonna put this PowerPoint up after, and you can use these URLs to start some research on this if you want. So Thomas, you take Afghanistan. Okay, so the other potential uh, Middle East topic uh, is resolved. The United States should withdraw from the Afghanistan peace process. Uh, like, I like I talked a little bit about before, um, the Basically, the origins of this topic, like the origins of the scenario that are uh, that's happening right now, is the U.S. intervention that started in 2001 and is still going on today. Um, it was initially called um, Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, and basically, right now, what the situation is, is since the Taliban um, overthrew the ISAF in 2004, um, like the legitimate, go the quote-unquote legitimate government that um, the Western bloc um, instilled in Afghanistan, since the Taliban um, overthrew them, the Taliban basically controls the majority of the country the government is not really seen as a legitimate actor and the United States is negotiating directly with the Taliban in order to try to quell tensions and create um, a more stable government uh, for the future um, basically the demands of both sides in this peace process right now on um, both sides want a full withdrawal of foreign troops um, but the, the US and the Taliban disagree on the timeline um, of that withdrawal I think um, the Taliban wants them to do it in nine months and the US wants like two years to do a full like downscaling of operations there um, but both sides also want a long um, lasting ceasefire in order to um, allow uh, like basically decreased violence in order for a, uh, a an agreement between the Taliban um, and the Afghan government um, to be created um, to basically create a ruling coalition um, that makes sense uh, for both parties in the, uh, in the long run. Um, on the U.S. side, what the U.S. is asking the Taliban to do is create guarantees um, of women's rights. That's a big um, push that um, the uh, U.S. negotiator has been making. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the Taliban has not been very willing to like accept this arrangement um they've basically said that it has to like um conform to like uh islamic standards and islamic laws so they can't necessarily um, create the guarantees that the u.s wants to the u.s is also demanding um that the taliban is focused um a lot on counter-terror um when the uh agreement is finalized um the problem here is that the u.s uh, is that the u.s government and the taliban um disagree on basically what constitutes um a terrorist group they disagree on what uh groups they should push to fight and what um basically methods they should use to fight those terrorist groups so that's basically like a demand that the u.s has made um that hasn't necessarily like uh, panned out um in the real world and the and negotiations um and also the u.s wants um uh, direct negotiation to happen between the taliban um and the afghan government uh the problem is right now that the taliban is not allowing that to happen uh they basically indicated that the only way that they will even like consider um, negotiating with the uh with the government itself is if they create um this ceasefire um, withdrawal agreements uh, with the United States, um, probably so that they have like a, a better uh, foot up in the, or like a leg up in the negotiating process, so they could probably uh, gain it more control of territory or a uh, larger seat um, in the government that will be established um, that basically like combines um, the Taliban um, and the existing um, Afghan government. On the Taliban side, there aren't like a lot of like uh, new demands that they have, but they definitely want uh, their primary goal in this negotiation process is to make sure that they have a powerful position in the government and that they don't have um, this massive Western interference that has in the past like um, uh, uh, like quelled rebellions um, and like uh, fought directly against the Taliban um, and prevented them from getting the seat um, on the government that they want to have. Um, and they want to make sure that uh, through this negotiation process, like I mentioned before, that um, um, if they ever uh, have to negotiate directly with the Afghan government, that they have a powerful enough position that they can um, they can get like a big leg up. Um, so let's talk about like a couple of arguments on both sides. 
Um, so let's start on the pro. Um, I think one of the biggest uh, pro arguments is going to be an argument about um, the legitimacy um, of the Afghan government. Right now, um, because uh, the U.S. is basically a barrier um, to um, the negotiations directly between the Taliban um, and the Afghan government, they are being cut out of peace talks. The problem uh, a lot of authors indicate, um, and it, uh, this warranting makes uh, quite a bit of sense, is if the peace talks um, end as they are laid out right now, that will basically um, the signal to uh, the people of, uh, of Afghanistan, to the Taliban, to the Afghan government, to nations outside of it, um, like uh, neighboring Afghanistan, that the U.S. and the international community does not believe that the Afghan government is like a legitimate institution. They do not believe that it's powerful enough to rule on its own, um, and they feel basically that uh, the, since the U.S. has to negotiate with them in order for them um, to, uh, the U.S. has to negotiate directly with the Taliban instead of including the Afghan government um, in the negotiation. Negotiations that prevents like long-term stability, just because they create uh, basically like cast them aside and prevents them from gaining like any traction within the negotiations. The story you would paint on the app here is if the U.S. Uh, withdrew from the talks, that would allow direct negotiations between um, the Taliban and the Afghan government, and you can make the argument that that probably um, leads to uh, a, a better government, just because there's more cooperation initially, or just more like. Uh, more people within Afghanistan view the government as a legitimate institution because they are the ones taking action. They do not have to rely on, on outside powers like the United States in order to like uh, further that process. The other argument um, I think you can make on the app that I think is probably harder to prove, but I think the literature is pretty good on, is that um, uh, foreign powers filling in um, for the United States is a good idea. And you can probably make the argument that other actors taking control of the peace process is a good idea. Um, and that could take like a couple of forms. Uh, the first is the app that um, Jack and I actually read on the April topic, which is that India should take control um, of the peace talks. Um, India has pushed for the Afghan government to be directly at the table and they have uh, quite a bit of influence. They also have um, direct um, they have like a lot of incentives to push for peace um, in Afghanistan. They have uh, a lot of incentives to have a stable government there just because of more uh, geographic proximity and also the fact that Pakistan um, backs the Taliban. <clears throat> so they probably have like a lot better incentive uh, geographically and geopolitically to create um, a stable lasting peace as well as probably the right incentives if you are uh, if you want to make the argument that the government must be included um, in the peace process. You can also find some other actor that you believe is um, a better to lead um, the peace talks that you think probably is better than like um, <clears throat> the U.S. influence, you can probably make the argument that in the past, uh, Western influence uh, in the Middle East, uh, Western interference um, in Middle Eastern politics has always failed to create a long-term stability uh, like we've talked about in this presentation. There have been plenty of uh, really good examples of um, U.S. or like other Western intervention failing, and you, make, you can make the argument that it's time to shift the balance of power uh, towards Russia or towards China. Um, again, I'm not sure how great the evidence is. I think uh, it's a pretty high burden of proof to uh, prove exactly like who would fill in and how exactly that would happen. Um, not a lot of authors uh, lay out that scenario super explicitly, so uh, you would have to find some pretty good evidence that indicates that A, Russia has an incentive to fill in, um, uh, B, that like Russia uh, would probably like uh, the only barrier to Russia, like Russian involvement, is uh, the U.S. presence, and then see why that's necessarily a good thing. Again, a pretty long link chain, but I think a pretty reasonable scenario if you can find some good evidence. <laughs> the other route that you could go is just generally, um, not necessarily like a utilitarian argument, but more like a deontological or like an ethical argument that um, neocolonialism um, and U.S. involvement is always going to be a bad idea, and basically we, uh, we should let um, Afghanistan and we should let other nations um, in the Middle East basically um, work out affairs for themselves, and that we should like uh, let nations develop by themselves in order to create um, better long-term agreements. Um, uh, and again, I this is uh, uh, something else that you probably have to find some pretty good evidence on um, as to why, like, uh, morally and ethically, the U.S. should, uh, like, withdraw um, from Afghanistan and allow that peace process to take place um, as it needs to. Um, let's go to the next. <coughs> uh, let's see. 
uh, on the net. Um, I think one of the main arguments people are going to make um, on the net on this topic is basically that uh, U.S. involvement is the least bad option on this, and there's really no other viable alternative that will create a long-term um, stable government in Afghanistan that prioritizes the right of the people. I think uh, you can make a pretty easy, compelling argument that the alternative to U.S. involvement um, is Taliban rule. Um, or even like um, a renewed conflict between the Taliban and the U.S. government, uh, and uh, sorry, the Taliban and the Afghan government. I think um, it's pretty easy to make the argument that because of U.S. involvement, that's probably like marginally decreasing the incentive uh, the Taliban has to be aggressive, and probably marginally decreasing their power um, in future negotiations with the Afghan government, just because uh, the U.S. is a powerful actor that can force them to make concessions now. So the peace process is probably more uh, quote unquote fair for the Afghan government um, going into the future. Um, and I think you can probably also make the argument that it's the least bad option just because um, on time frame it will probably wrap up the war the quickest, the quickest it has a chance um, to make sure that the war ends as quickly as possible. There's a lot of recent evidence that indicates that uh, basically the, uh, the U.S. and the Taliban are on the verge of a breakthrough. There have been like a lot of uh, really good agreements on the peace process. There's a lot of progress that has been made recently. So we should probably, uh, you can make the argument on the neck that we should probably continue our current path vote neg and basically like see where this takes us before we like take a massive pivot and simply just like withdraw from these peace talks altogether. Um, the other argument that you can make, um, again, similar to like this least bad option framing, is that the current peace framework um, in general um, is good, right? Um, because both sides have agreed that there will be decreased U.S. troop involvement, you can probably make the, uh, the argument that, hey, um, we want like the, the U.S. Um, to be involved as a negotiator just because they're a strong voice um, and a strong presence that can help uh, decrease Taliban um, power and influence overall. However, if we continue uh, with this peace process, that will probably lead to a decrease in U.S. troop commitments, and maybe that's good um, for, like, uh, like you can go two routes, you can either go that like that decreases like U.S. troop fatalities, or I think the better argument is that probably leads to more long-term stability, just because there are fewer foreign actors uh, with boots on the ground um, in Afghanistan um, specifically. Um, uh, and you can probably argue that if the U.S. deal falls apart, we, we will probably like have an incentive to maintain true presence because maybe like um, infighting will break out again. Um, and that will probably just like uh, increase instability. More foreign actors will become involved, and uh, Afghanistan will be, uh, like descend into chaos again. Um, the other arguments that you can make, I think, are that U.S. presence is key to push for reform. Again, um, I think it's pretty easy to make the argument that because the U.S. is such um, like a strong presence, um, that they can maybe push for some reforms within Afghanistan. Again, it's a little bit tricky since the Taliban is not necessarily agreeing to all of the U.S.'s demands. But you can probably make some arguments as to why it's good for the U.S. to be involved in the talks, maybe to push um, for women's rights, or maybe to push for some other reform um, that. Uh, uh, that you find that the U.S. is pushing for that uh, you feel is needed um, in the Afghan government or uh, within the Taliban specifically. <clears throat> then I think the final argument we can make is basically the flip side of this villain argument. Um, basically make the argument that the U.S. is the least bad actor to run these peace talks. Um, and if the U.S. Um, U.S. influence decreases in Afghanistan or decreases in the peace talks, that will lead to more um, international influence by some other actor. I think a couple of actors that you could uh, pick that could be viable, um, again, the link story might be a little bit iffy, but would probably be uh, like Russia or China, like I mentioned before. Maybe you can make the argument that uh, their involvement would lead to uh, more instability. Maybe they have like worse incentives in the U.S., maybe they'll strengthen the Taliban, and the Taliban is a bad ruler, um, or something like that, or it'll lead to like more proxy conflicts uh, within uh, the Middle East because of Afghanistan will become um, a Russian or a Chinese, um, uh, basically like a proxy, and they'll use that to like uh, increase uh, uh, like Afghanistan's foreign policy in the Middle East and become more aggressive. Something along those lines that would be potentially a viable path. I think the other path that you could go down um, with the Afghanistan argument. Uh, or like with the fill-in argument is that potentially you can make an argument that uh, Pakistan will fill in just because Pakistan has such close um, ties with the Taliban. Maybe again that'll lead to a uh, Taliban-centric government, or maybe that will uh, inflame uh, tensions uh, between um, India and Pakistan. There is actually quite a bit, uh, 
uh, quite a bit of good evidence that indicates that the peace process uh, in Afghanistan has a lot of impacts um, on the conflict between India and Pakistan. So if you want to go for like the big, bad, scary, like uh, nuclear war impacts, that is probably the way to go. Uh, figure out ways that the uh, the peace process in Afghanistan uh, impacts um, the uh, India-Pakistan relations and how, um, how that could potentially like either like increase or decrease tensions um, in Kashmir. Uh, really briefly, before we go back to Q&A, just a brief correction on something further back in the PowerPoint. Uh, you'll recall that I talked about um, the in this slide about international intervention and the Anglo-Soviet invasion way back when it was like around World War II. Uh, little thing I forgot to put on the slide here. Um, Reza Shah was after forced out, after he was forced out of Iran and deposed. He was replaced by a, his a son, also named Reza Shah, as part and. That son was the one who was replaced and ousted by Muhammad Mossadegh, and then when before Mossadegh was overthrown, that Reza Shah was the one who was reinstated. So, anyways, now that that's done, uh, let's go into some Q and A. There are also some links about Afghanistan here. So, any questions about the presentation or anything you've seen thus far? If so, send it in the chat. We'll take a few minutes for this. We uh, were we were very broad, and we definitely missed like a lot of details about the Middle East because if we spent too much time on every detail, it would take a very long time. So if you have any questions about those details, feel free to ask. <laughs> we'll give it like a couple minutes, and if we have no response, we're just gonna end the stream. All right, seeing the lack of questions, we're just gonna end the stream here. Uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, this will be posted on the Facebook later. Feel, for any of the workshop students who see this after the fact, feel free to message me or Thomas with any questions. Uh, have a good day, y'all.